As an internal medicine physician in Kansas, Dr. Sapna Shah Hawk knows a thing or two about burnout. It's something she has faced more than once. Her colleagues have also experienced it. Burnout can take many different forms, including suicide. Until the mental health of medical staff can be addressed through the system, Dr. Shaw Hawk set out on a journey to help physicians and healthcare professionals realize they are not alone. Her path took her to find ways to help herself and her colleagues reclaim their humanity while they continue to practice medicine. She is a co-author of a book, Thriving After Burnout, and is the host of the Worthy Physician podcast. Please welcome Dr. Sapna Shah Hawk. So tell us about your youth. Was your family in medicine too? Oh, no. No, my mom's a retired Spanish teacher. My dad was an accountant. So medicine was something that I had always been interested in science and figuring things out. I like the detective work, if you will, and that's the, that's the reason why I'm an internist. It's nothing considered to be the family business. Did you always want to be a doctor from day one, or was it something you developed as you got older? Kind of, I mean, there's always been that interest and that curiosity, but, you know, four-year-old me wanted to do about five different things. <laughs> and then one of the concerns I had about medicine was the time it took to study and reach the end goal. So I was really deterred initially from that. I started out engineering, actually, electrical engineering. And when, you know, a circuit started smoking on me because we used the wrong chip that was in the wrong drawer for a circuit, and I did not care, that really, it spoke to me. Yeah, you know, I, I needed to figure out something else to do. And at the time I was working in the hospital, uh, an entry level job, and I really enjoyed being around the sick people. So that's when I decided to change. It is quite a commitment to go to medical school. And how intense can you describe that training? And is this where the start of burnout comes from? The training is actually pretty intense, right? We have all these soups we have to jump through. And it's not just going to college and getting good grades. It's trying to find clinical experience, getting those letter of recommendations, plus or minus research. And what would an undergrad do for research? Well, it depends on where you are and what opportunities you have. So from day one, when you decide that you want to apply to medical school, there are different things that you need to do outside of your book work. And then when you get into medical school, that's quite an experience in and of itself with the application process. So from the time you enter medical school, you are told, and yes, it is an honor to actually be part of those patients' journeys and be studying with patients on people, especially during clinicals. But what they don't tell you is the amount of debt that you accumulate and the culture of medicine within medical school. And then what you think medicine is going to be like when you actually go into medical school in the way that it is after it's quite intense. And yes, there are studies that do show that burnout begins within medical school. Yeah, I would imagine. Now, when you were in school, did you know right away that you were going to go into internal medicine? Or is this something that you figured out towards the end of your schooling? A little bit of both. I was working as a phlebotomist. That was the way I worked my way through college and grad school. Um, I, I did work with in an internal medicine office as a phlebotomist, and then I shuttled an old Scottish doctor during my undergrad when I was applying. So I had mentors that were internists, but I really fell in love with internal medicine. I think during my third year of medical school, and that really just sealed the deal. Otherwise, it would have been psychiatry or pathology. How many years of schooling is it? Because you've got your general medical, right? And then you have to take extra schooling for the specialization too, don't you? 
Right. So it's four years of undergrad and then four years of medical school if you make it in the first time. And if you there's no repeat, there's no gap year or you don't do a master's. And then during residency, it's at least three years. Some residencies are five. And you do get a salary during that. Never try to calculate how much you make per hour because it's less than minimum wage. But with that, I took a little bit of the scenic route. So it took me about 10 years. Wow. You have to really want to be a doctor to do that. Right. You do. You do. So while, yes, the salary is high, but so are the stakes, right? Because we start 10 years behind the eight ball actually earning. And then... 200,000 plus is the debt for medical school. That's not including interest. That's not including other loans that you've had to take out. That's not even including undergrad. So it's not cheap. No, no. Well, no schooling is cheap, but I can, that is (laughs) is crazy. (laughs) Yeah. So most people have an idea what internal medicine is, but can you kind of give us an overview of what that covers? Sure. So it's a lot of disease management, disease prevention in adults, so that'd be 18 and older, from the mouth to the butt and everything in between. We're not great at dermatology. I don't think anybody's good at dermatology except for dermatologists, but we take care of a lot of like chronic diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and everything in between. A lot of times they're the first line to diagnose under the chronic diseases, such as atrial fibrillation, coronary artery disease, rheumatoid arthritis, Mm. and then we get you to the right specialist. There were enough demands on doctors prior to COVID-19, and since the pandemic, Mm. burnout seems to be commonplace now in all medical areas. Um, What are you seeing in your area of what this looks like? Gosh, yeah. The pandemic brought that to the forefront, didn't it? I mm-hmm. I think that everybody was burned out already, but didn't really have a term. And I was not familiar with the term until 2019, before the pandemic. But I think that what one of the most study, one of the most recent studies, up to 63% of practicing physicians at least has one symptom of burnout. And that is only what is reported because remember, if we report these feelings or these thoughts of I'm burned out, I might, and that's not to be confused with depression, but there is a concern of, gosh, what is the professional liability? You know, what's going to happen to my license if I try to address this and ask for help? It kind of sounds like where you see professional athletes where they're afraid to really say what's going on with with an injury because they know that it will put them on the sidelines. There's got to be even more pressure on the medical professionals to try and suck it up even more to keep on going and not let anybody know. If there is no will politically or administratively to deal with burnout and the mental health of healthcare workers, what will the impact eventually be? Oh, I think we're already seeing it. I think we're already seeing it. At least 25% of physicians in the next year or two years will leave medicine, whether it is to retire early, cut back, or even go to non-clinical positions. Nursing, they're leaving bedside nursing within the first two years of coming out of nursing school. You know, with a great resignation and the shortage of hospital beds, it's not necessarily a shortage of hospital beds right now. It's a shortage of staff to staff those beds. So we're already seeing the effects. And that is not even capturing the 400 physicians that take their life per year in the United States. Wow. Yeah, that's in the United States alone. That's not reflecting anything that is going on in the UK. We know that their junior doctors have been on strike. We know that Canada is facing the same thing, your physicians. Mm -hmm. And 
how is that okay? I mean, how is all of this okay? If this were any other profession, <laughs> it would be talked about. You're right. It's just crazy because nobody seems to be willing to address it or they think that throwing money at it will fix it. <laughs> Let's put it this way. I work part-time for my own sanity. And that is because I like to do other things outside of medicine. There is no amount of money I could be offered that would make me change my mind because my mental sanity and my ability to look at myself in the mirror with self-respect is much more important than a dollar amount. That brings me into a question I was going to ask you as well is the trend does seem here also in Alberta, the trend does seem to be that physicians are only available, general practitioners are only available two to three days a week, three days usually, but four if you're lucky. Is that why to keep out the burnout? What's the misconception about that? Because some people will think that, oh, well, they're just lazy. They don't want to work. <laughs> no, it's not that I don't want to work. I know different, but. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that I don't want to work. I have no problem working very hard. And the reason why I say that is because I've done seven days a week. I've done two jobs at once while doing my MBA and applying to medical school. I've done a 48 hour shift. I've done all of that. So I've paid my dues to get into medical school. I've done medical school residency. And for the last about eight years prior to the pandemic, I was working crazy hours. What happened was we, ha we work within a system and I'm not familiar enough with the Canadian system, but here from the US, we work within a system where the costs keep rising. Mm. The reimbursement keeps dropping. And I've heard that reimbursement keeps dropping in Canada as well. Yes, that's true. So when you have to see, for example, 10 years ago, let's say I'm just for easy math, you had to see 10 patients in order to, and that was your overhead. And everything else was, you know, salary or you eat what you kill. So that was your take home. But does that even cover your loans? The student loans. <laughs> <laughs> No, that's what moonlighting is for, right? right? That's what moonlighting is for. <laughs> that's the extra. So you've done your day job. Now you go do your night job to cover your loans for medical school and to cover the interest. So that's where people get it wrong. It's not that we don't want to work hard. It's just that the amount that we're expected to work as society sees us, we're supposed to be working all the time. Well, if I were to put that back on you as a patient or as a quote unquote, and I hate this term, I hate it a consumer, you're not a consumer of healthcare. I'm the physician, you're the patient, we're a team. We're a team for your health. If I were to throw that back on you, you would look at me like I'm insane. Mm -hmm. Why? And it's not, it has nothing to do with the profession we chose. It's the fact that I'm human, I need sleep, I need to actually take care of myself, I need outlets for my stress because we have we are, hold, are held to the same code of ethics that I would say like a priest or a lawyer. We do not talk about anything with anybody else that happened with that ex within that exam room. And if you can imagine doing that 20 times a day, that's a lot to take on. Yeah. And then when you cannot address those patients' needs because insurance company says, I'm not going to approve the MRI because they haven't tried physical therapy first, or I don't think that that it's necessary because you need x-rays first. And then here's the kicker. The doctor that I, the person, the peer-to-peer the -peer I'm going to have that review with may not be a physician. It may be a nurse, maybe a nurse practitioner. It may be a PA. So that's not a peer-to-peer. -peer. That's not comparing the like to like. We have different clinical levels of practice, okay? So that's not a peer-to-peer. -peer. And then it might not even be the correct specialty. It might be a pathologist, it might be a dermatologist, it might be a ob guy that sold their soul to the insurance companies <laughs> to say yes or no to tests that I want to order. They're not even in the exam room. More than likely, they have not even looked at the claim 
that I'm what I'm looking for. They're just looking at a box that is checked or not. And then they might not have even seen a patient within X amount of years where they're so you tell me how that's okay and you, that's okay to practice in. Yeah. And then you have to go tell the patient. And that doesn't just happen once, that happens multiple times a day on testing, on medication. Medications that are first line or second line to treat diabetes are denied by insurance companies oh because my God. they're too costly. It's only in America, too. Every other country <laughs> has everything covered. <laughs> right. And they're not even made here in the States, but they're $500, $600 drugs that are... I can't that... even imagine that stress on a doctor where you have to deny a cancer patient treatment because an insurance company won't, unless they pay out of pocket, but they still have to pay out of pocket. <laughs> Luckily, I'm not an oncologist, but I've had patients where they had to wait for a few weeks for insurance to approve a medication that is life-saving. Oh my God. How, why the rest of us in the rest of the world look and think, why, you know? <laughs> Be Because they can make money off of it. Yeah. Yeah. They can make money off of it. So it is totally understandable the burnout and some of the dark thoughts that go through people's minds. And particularly with COVID, it's happened a few times and where somebody has ended their life and couldn't, couldn't finish. Uh, when that happens, obviously it puts even more stress on the rest of the medical staff because they have to take over that person's patients and that their duties. So what happens to a hospital or an office when that happens? Is there any support administratively from say the hospital administration or it's just like, well, here, you got to do this now? No, there, there is support. I work in an area, I work in rural Kansas and I work in a small rural community. And we're like family. We had a podiatrist die unexpectedly. And he was my age. Mm. He was young. And they shut down the surgery department so that way he could attend his funeral. And there was counseling available through the a hospital. However, that doesn't take away the loss and part of the, the actual reason why I started doing what I'm doing is because my best friend died by suicide in her office in 2019. Oh, God. We went to medical school together. We did residency together. She was from the same town in which I practice. But you know that when somebody takes their life at the hospital or in their office, it sends a message. And it's not a good one. And it's crystal clear the love-hate relationship I think that they have. I could have done it anywhere else. I wish it didn't happen. I wish it didn't have to happen in the first place. But the reason why is because she was afraid to seek professional help because she was concerned of what it would do to her medical license. She was concerned about professional repercussion. So what would be the professional repercussions if you said, hey, I need help. It's a great question. So every year when I go to renew my medical license, I'm in Kansas. So I fill out a form for the Board of Healing Arts every every June. Back before 2019 in October, back before at that time, there were questions of, do you suffer from depression? Do you suffer from anxiety? Do you suffer from substance abuse or any other medical, sorry, psychiatric or mental health condition. That was it. So if you check yes, does that mean that you're going to be investigated? Does that mean that you're going to be having your license pulled or suspended? And then going back to that debt, you know, who, who's going to pay for that? That doesn't go away. That only goes away if you die. 
Oh my but, God. you know, there's this luminous question in the room. That's the elephant in the room of what is actually going to happen. Since October 31st, 2019, Kansas is now one of 13 states that has uh, the question worded or questions worded, compiled into one question asking, do you have anxiety, depression, substance abuse, or any other mental health disease that would, that would hinder your ability to practice. That's quite medicine. a loaded question for having all that in one. <laughs> it is, but they lumped it into one because they're asking if any of this would hinder your ability to practice medicine, hmm. which is much different than do you suffer from depression? Yeah. Because depression you know, even is pretty if... common for everybody. You yes. can still function. Yes. Well, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> That's the whole point, right? We're human. We see a lot. We take on yeah. a lot. You know, one of the professional liabilities is just an occupational hazard is a lawsuit. One bad outcome because somebody didn't do what they were told or if a delivery goes bad for no circum no fault of their OBs, a surgery is does not have a good outcome because a patient is a diabetic and a heart patient. Now, these are just everyday scenarios. It's real life. Not all outcomes are good. I can't um, even imagine how much extra that liability insurance is. I imagine it's almost as much as your student loans. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, they look at the profession and, you know. Because it's such a litigious like, world right now, right? Yeah. Yeah. But... You know, it's a big deal to have those questions changed. And so I'm open. I practice in a state that that has a question phrased that way. So I'm open about the fact that, yeah, I've been in therapy since 2019 because, or sorry, 2020, because of my friend's suicide. Yeah. I mean, that would shake you right to your core. That's another reason why I went part-time to answer one of your questions and that's because I have chosen to live my life, to live life, not live to work. I work to live. Mm. You know, I like I like to do other things. I have a family. So I like to be present with everything possible. So that's why I have chosen to do what I do. Other than being patient and kind, how can patients help struggling physicians and healthcare workers from losing their mental health or at least helping them cope through the day. Give us grace. Mm. You know, give us grace. We're human too. I'm sorry I didn't call you about your normal lab. Sign up for the patient portal. Yeah, I'm going to own up to my short ends that that's on me give us that grace if we can't see you in the same day please understand that it's not because we don't want to we're working within a system that we are spending more time checking boxes that has nothing to do with the visit but has everything to do with reimbursement and insurance because all those entities that are not within the exam room make the rules we have to follow, and it's not as easy as we would like it to be. What are some signs of hope that you see for the future of medicine, or are there any? <laughs> there are. There are. There are. It looks bleak right now because of everything that we hear but you know i also truly believe that in dark times we have to look for the silver lining and no it's not i've drank the kool-aid or anything but i see hope in these new medical students the ones that are graduating and coming into residency or are residents currently they are looking more at the work-life balance as leadership changes in institutions and we have 
I'm going to say it, younger people mm -hmm. that have newer ideas and are not part of the paternalistic culture of medicine, as we have more women leading that remember <laughs> what it's like to be a mom and have a career, as we, under, as we have leadership that understands that each generation in the workplace are going to have different needs, depending on where we are in life, and it's not a one-size-fits-all, I do think that medicine is changing. The Lorna Brain Foundation is doing a lot of good work in order to have those licensing questions changed and also to have the credentialing questions changed at institutions. So there are grassroots movements. Is there a shortage of people going into medical? medicine to be nurses and to be doctors or it just takes so long to go through the schooling all the above okay because okay. with people aging out besides the burning out and i don't want to do this anymore i imagine it's just not enough people to fill those spots all the above you know and the reason why I say that is because we have several residency spots that go unfilled. Yeah. it's I don't know about the States, but here in Canada, you could have been schooled for 10 years in India or in any other country overseas. But when you come here to North America, all of a sudden, it's like you never went to school and you got to start all over again. Is there starting to become a pathway for some of these physicians and healthcare workers that come over to get into the positions faster? And why is it so different? <laughs> why is their training so different than what it is here? Or is it I, the insurance aspect of it? <laughs> no, I don't. I think the training is different because of a different system. Oh. The knowledge doesn't change, but how it's practiced and how it's applied. Mm. So I would not feel comfortable, even though I have been an internist for 10 years, the disease doesn't change just because I go overseas. Yeah. However, I could pick up the language pretty quickly, but definitely the ability to learn the system and such like that. And then, yes, there are some discrepancies depending on where they trained with the, with the system here in North America. I think that's two part, but yes, a lot of those are filled by IMGs or international medical graduates, but a lot of them are still left open. And then we have to remember that a lot are looking at, even if they do go through nursing or what have you, a lot of them do leave in the first couple of years. So what inspires you? Honestly, again, it's going to sound silly, but I work with a great team. I love my patients. I really do. And I just came off of a couple tough weeks and I only work part-time, so how can be tough? It's, we have tough days where it's like mm -hmm. four days in a row, just everything is double, triple booked. Yeah. And then with the small kids and with other things on top of that, life happens. But my patients, my family, and my my awesome workplace. That's what keeps me going. That's what inspires me. That and speaking about physician burnout and moral injury. Thank you so much. I so appreciate you finding the time to be here. 